for the <coughs> morning session today. It's a bit after the morning. Uh, uh, and it's a pleasure to have uh, Gabriel Kerr from Kansas. Uh, Kansas State. Kansas State. Uh, <laughs> 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 Talking about uh, neurosymmetry for elementary by rational components. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much to the uh, organizers for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So, yeah, so today I want to talk about uh, homological neurosymmetry for uh, elementary birational cobordisms, and I'll, I'll try to explain uh, some of the words in that title. Um, all right, so here's my outline. I'm going to start by just giving a general setup of the kind of question I'm, I'm going to answer, and I, I won't really give a proof of this, uh, but maybe online I'll, I'll give some notes that are a little more extended with proof, or at least a sketch of a proof. Um, and uh, so this will be fairly vague, and in the second two uh, sections I'll, I'll give a more precise notion of what I mean uh, in this motivational uh, part. All right, so let me start there. So uh, what kind of uh, version of homological near symmetry am I thinking about? I'm going to be thinking about a case where I have a, a Deline Mumford stack, X, and then I have some mirror potential, uh, which is going to be some polymorphic function on a, on a mirror manifold to, to C. Uh, and the particular version of homological mirror symmetry I'm looking at is an equivalence between two uh, triangulated categories, um, or derived categories. Uh, one is the derived category of coherent sheaves on X, which is, is on the left-hand side, and the other is, is known as the Fukaya seidel category of uh, this, uh, this function W. So we can think of, if we're thinking of the last talk, this function W will be some, some left shits vibration on the, the mirror manifold. So under these circumstances, with, with some conditions, uh, we can define this Fukaya side case. So the mirror manifold is manifold. I mean, even though X is a stock, the mirror yeah. manifold is an oldest manifold. Yeah, in this case. So yeah, as I said, I'll be very vague here, uh, but I'll be more precise. All right, so of course, both sides of this equivalence, uh, or this conjectural equivalence, are, are very complicated on their face. Um, and so I'm going to ask some very naive questions about uh, both of them. And the first question is, uh, are there natural decompositions for either side of this equivalence? Um, and then the second question is, if I had some natural decomposition of the category on the left and some natural uh, decomposition of the category on the right, uh, is there a way of, of that homological mirror symmetry will send one to the other? So will, will this equivalence respect these decompositions uh, in, in some nice way? OK, so let me take the, the first question first. Um, well. There are a lot of natural decompositions for uh, a derived category of coherent sheaves on, on, a, on let's say, a variety or, or a stack. Um, but the one I want to look at comes from maybe birational geometry um, and maybe is pioneered by uh, Pondo and Orloff. Um, but there's a lot of more recent works uh, considering this from rather from uh, variation of GIT uh, rather than a minimal model sequence. But anyway, so suppose we have some minimal model sequence on X um, given by uh, a set of birational maps, um, and then maybe FR is, is some kind of Mori vibration or, or something slightly more general. Uh, then there are some results that say that we can decompose our uh, category of coherent sheaves uh, into some semi orthogonal decomposition. Um, where each of these little categories comes from a particular birational map, our variation of GIT, and uh, then at the end you're left with sort of the, the derived category of some minimal model. Um, and so if we think of this rather, rather than thinking of this as a minimal model sequence but a variation of GIT, we can uh, often, uh, well, sometimes end up with a, a vacuum at the end, and then this, this category is zero, and we just decompose our uh, drive category into a bunch of uh, subcategories, <coughs> where the structure of these subcategories is really understood from this uh, variation GITs. 
These are called wall contribution categories. In practice, uh, the way you, you get something like this, or at least the way I would get something like this, is we start in this uh, Picard, you start in your nef cone, and you take some straight line to the boundary of your effective cone, and you're crossing sort of walls in some Mori fan, and each time you cross a wall, you get one of these uh, variations. So this is a, a nice answer, and there's a, there's some a lot of literature to, to describe this answer on the B model side. So what about the A model side? Uh, well, this is a little more delicate. We need to take a few steps to describe uh, the answer here. So the first step is I want to replace my Lefschetz vibration, W, which is some holomorphic function, um, just conceptually with a different function, uh, which is, I wrote it as lowercase w. And instead of thinking this is a holomorphic function from some variety to, uh, say, C, I'll think of this as a one-parameter family of hypersurfaces in my, uh, my mirror manifold. And so then I, if, I, if I'm in a good situation, I have some moduli stack of such hypersurfaces, and I can just think of this function as being pulled back from some representing function from C to my moduli stack of hypersurfaces. So that's my first step. It's just reimagining my potential uh, as a function from C to a moduli stack. And the next step, I just compactify all things that I can. Uh, so I'll compactify the range of my potential to P1. I'll compact, I have some nice compactifications in mind of my moduli stack of hypersurfaces and, some degen and their degenerations. And then that, that leads, me to, leads me to some compactification of the, the mirror map. Um, but here, really, I haven't done anything uh, yet. And so the, the thing to do uh, at this stage is to then deform my, uh, my compactification uh, over some disk, say. Um, so here I put some parameter on my potential, say t, so that at, at 1 it's equal to my nice, uh, the, the potential that represented the original potential. Uh, and then I, I take t going to 0. And I see what happens. All right, so here's kind of a, a picture of what would happen. So we hit, this is the image uh, at t equaling 1 inside of my moduli stack. And I imagine, you know, well, this is some moduli stack of hypersurfaces. And so inside of that moduli stack of hypersurfaces, I have all the singular hypersurfaces. Right? And so I indicate the intersection of the image of w1 with, those singular, with, the, with that discriminant variety in sort of red points. And then I start deforming, and I go to some limit, some maximal limit, and I bubbled off a bunch of P1s. And this is the advantage of, of doing a nice compactification, so I get some stable limit. And uh, if I do everything uh, nicely, I can hope that uh, I've isolated a bunch of critical values of my potential uh, on each of these uh, components in this limited uh, limiting map. Okay. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of possible degenerations, just like there are a lot of possible minimal models, uh, minimal model runs. Um, but there's some correspondence between these. So uh, in fact, so one thing to say for those that, that haven't looked at Foucault's IDL categories, at least in this context, um, is that these, these red points are, are really uh, important for Foucault's IDL categories. The way you define them is you you you, well, one way of defining them is you can take a bunch of paths to these points. These paths will give you objects in a particular category, uh, and then those objects generate this Foucault Seidel category. Um, so it, what what happens through this procedure is you're organizing these critical values into groups, and that organization then can be uh, unraveled in such a way as to give you uh, uh, Foucault Seidels for each of these pieces and a semi-orthogonal decomposition for, for the global category. And so that's the, that's the last step, is that over each of these components in the limit, uh, you want to pull back this representing this limiting representing map uh, to give you sort of individual potentials. Um, and then consider Fukaya Seidel categories of, of these pieces. Uh, and, and in this case, we'll get a semi-orthogonal decomposition of, this, of the initial Fukaya Seidel in terms of these so this is my natural 
<laughs> way of decomposing Fukai aside. Okay. Yes. Huh? What was U? Uh, U is this universal hypersurface universal. over the modular stuff. All right, so now the second question, uh, we have a decomposition on the, the B model side, um, and we have a decomposition on the A model side, and is it the case that these, uh, the homological mirror symmetry will send one such decomposition to the other? Um, so in the toric setting, which is really uh, the setting I'll focus on today, um, along with Colin Beamer and Lumo Kutsarkov, we, we gave a, an explicit prescription for, for taking one of these well, straight line minimal model runs, or variation of GIT, uh, a sequence um, to, a, to a particular degeneration, very prescription, uh, prescriptive degeneration of mirror potentials. Uh, in fact, where you can, you can really just write down um, coefficients of the, of the potential to tell you uh, which direction you want to go. So, so outside of the work setting, is it possible, is it always possible to, to, to have a DGIT sequence which terminates in zero? No. <laughs> no, no. But, well, hopefully we'll learn something that we could apply outside of this. And furthermore, we have a theorem that will say that, uh, or we have a theorem that says that the rank of the K theories, or the growth and D groups of these, these semi-orthogonal components, that they're equal on the A model side and the B model side. So the number of critical points were, uh, uh, was equal to in this limit on the A model side was equal to some exceptional collection given by Kawamata on the B model side. Um, and so this is, at least we took this as very strong evidence that we could get corresponding decompositions uh, and that at least they look like they might be equivalent. All right, but, but it left open, of course, the, the actual equivalence of categories, which needs, needed to be proven and still needs to be proven in, in so, so that's my motivation, is to, to prove that statement, that at least uh, there exists an equivalence of categories between these, these pieces, um, at least in some, some understandable cases, some elementary cases. All right, so now that was very vague, I, I understand that, and now I want to uh, uh, be more precise about these variations of GIT, and in particular these pieces that we're getting. So what is an elementary birational cobordism? Uh, so I'm taking a little bit of liberty with these. Uh, you can do something slightly more general, and I think call it an elementary birational cobordism, then, but mine will be special cases, let's say. Uh, so I'm gonna start with just some, some lattice uh, element uh, with, with coordinates A not three D, and I'm going to assume that all of these are non-zero, and uh, really that's it. Then I'm going to describe a variation of GIT given this, this element A, or this lattice element. And basically, this is just a, a character for a C star action on uh, affine space. But of course, when you have an action of C star, well, of a group on affine space, uh, there are a lot of different uh, ways of quotienting uh, depending on what your polarization is. So if you want to do GIT, you need to choose polarization, or uh, a positive or a negative line bundle, given by a positive or a negative character on C star. Uh, and in these two different cases, you'll get different unstable loci, which are both coordinate planes. Um, the B minus is going to correspond to just setting all of the coordinates equal to zero, where AI is less than zero. And similarly, the B plus is take ZI equals zero if AI is positive. So if you excise these uh, unstable loci, then you can form the nice GIT quotient uh, just by quotienting by the action. And this is the, the variation of GIT that, uh, that I want to consider. These are my elementary birational coordinates. So maybe it's worth uh, pointing, doing some examples in this case uh, right away. So one example, you know, you could take all of these AIs to be positive. Yeah. If you take all of the AIs to be positive, well, then B minus is, is sort of a vacuous condition. So B minus just con contains everything. It's all of affine space. So if you remove B minus, right, to get X minus, you get the empty set. On the other hand, uh, B plus, 
is just is just the point zero. You remove zero and you take your quotient and you'll get a uh, weight of projective space uh, with a naught through a d as your as your weights. So this describes going from weight of projective space to the to the vacuum. Uh, if you let just one of these be negative and all the others be positive, then this will describe a weighted blow up of a point. If you take two to be negative and the rest to be positive, then you get a notion of a flip. Um, well, let's say that there's that D is greater than two. Then you get a flip. Um, and so yeah, so these these describe a lot of the elementary birational transformations that you see in, in as your as your first examples of um, birational transformations. All right, so now I'm going to add one more number, which is just the sum of all the AIs, uh, and I'll take it's negative, and I'm just going to add that as a final coordinate, bringing up my rank by one, uh, and I do that for for reasons. Well, we'll see later with why we won't, may want to do this. Um, but once I do this, then I have this nice, uh, well, even before I did that, I have a nice theorem by, I think in this context, originally by Kawamata, um, but there's a much more general version of this in, by Ballard, uh, Favera, and Sarkov, uh, and by uh, Halpern Leisner, um, which, which describes the derived category coherent sheaves on, on the plus quotient in terms of that of the minus quotient and an additional semi-orthogonal component, uh, which I'm writing here as TV sub A. Furthermore, uh, because really I made that choice that all of the AIs are, are non-zero, uh, in this particular case, this category, uh, this component category, has a complete exceptional collection, um, which is you know, certainly not true in, in more general cases. Uh, furthermore, if, what, if I want to understand, say, this, this collection, there's, there's a nice way of understanding it by just taking this, this category and embedding it into the equivariant sheaves on just af affine space, c, c to the d plus 1. Um, and here, then, this, these objects, e naught through, through e, <coughs> well, through this last exceptional object, are just, uh, just the equivariant structure sheaves of b minus. Uh, you know, with a great with a weight shifting by i, so the i exceptional object has its weight shifted by i. What's x? Ah, x. X is this. X is uh, affine space. Just c d plus one. So this is just c star is just x. I mean, I keep x around because you know maybe event x is really a local model, right? We have we can think of this as acting on some variety. We have some local model a point where we're doing this transformation. But yeah, we'll just take x to be. All right, so now the point is, is that not all complete exceptional collections are alike. And one thing you might want to know is how do we describe this category, uh, which is this, this semi-orthogonal piece. And so in order, an equivalent question is, what is the endomorphism, or the DG algebra, the endomorphism algebra, of the, the direct sum of these exceptional objects. So if you can describe that, uh, then you will have a, uh, an understanding, or at least a representation, of this, uh, this semi-orthogonal component. And so that's what we want to compute. But this is actually kind of a, more or less, a, an elementary exercise in, in homological algebra. Uh, all you have to do first is you, you get, take your equivariant sheaf on affine space uh, and, and recognize that if I'm going to do some weight shifting, that the endomorphism algebra, well, that hom from, from f shifted by i, f shifted by j, is the same thing as just looking at the endomorphism algebra in the ordinary non-equivariant category, uh, but then looking at the graded piece that is of degree j minus i. So this means that if I want to compute this, really I, I just need to look at the endomorphism algebra of OB minus, excuse me, where f is OB minus, and understanding that endomorphism uh, uh, algebra will, will give me full structure. But of course, this is an elementary computation uh, where you just you see that the the endomorphism algebra in this in this setting is actually formal 
um, it's, it's quasi-isomorphic to its, its x, uh, just using causal resolution, um, which in this case is just uh, the, cone, uh, the exterior uh, algebra of the co-normal bundle. But this exterior algebra of the co-normal bundle is just the is a super symmetric algebra of a vector space. Uh, and let me just say what this vector space is. So this vector space V naught, well, you just take, again, I mean, you rely on this element A. You take the, poly the, the monomial. <coughs> this should be taken as uh, a spanning set here. Uh, so just take the monomials where AI is uh, positive and take the uh, the uh, one forms dzi where ai is negative. And so then this makes a, a graded vector space. And to distinguish degree, the homological degree from so the, the, the weight of the action, uh, I'll write weight instead of degree. Uh, of course, the weight of zi is just coming from uh, the character ai. And the weight of tzi is, acquires a negative. But what that says is, of course, this is just going to be some positive uh, weight in space vector space, and we take the supersymmetric algebra where the supersymmetry is coming from the degree rather than the weight. And so then, if I call Ra this supersymmetric algebra, which this, again, this is just a polynomial algebra in the supersense, uh, I can isolate um, uh, the degree k part, and then this gives me a nice uh, representation of this uh, the category as modules over a particular uh, endomorphism. So let me write out a few examples just to get our headers, heads around this. So if A is 1, 1, 2, or negative 2, uh, then again we have three variables, Z0, Z1, DZ2. Uh, this is again a case where all of these A's were positive, and then I added that A, D plus 1 at the end, um, which of course will have to be negative. Um, and, well, the sum of these guys is, two, of all the AIs except the last one, is, well, this, the absolute value of this. So I have two objects. Uh, I have a Z1 and a Z0. And, of course, as everyone knows, or many people know, uh, this is just a Kronecker quiver, which gives us a valence and um, exceptional collection for P1. You can do this for, uh, for uh, weight of projective line or weight of projective space. Uh, here, you, you have five objects. You have to take the sum of these guys. And uh, and then the, the, the weights of the monomials are slightly different. So, so I just it's actually lost the parenthesis with the number, what does it do? Uh, but this, this A? So no, this no, I mean the RA is OK, but then RA is parenthesis 3. What is it, 3? RA 3. This one? Yeah, what is it, 3? Ah, yeah, so this is, so RA is this, but this is this has actually two, uh, it's, a bi, it's bi graded. Uh -huh. The DZ is, is, has a degree one, it's a homological degree. And then the Z naught, Z1, and well, the Z naught and Z1 have, have weights, two and three, and the DZ has a weight five, because we have a negative there. That's right. So this is a, a weight, a bi-graded space, and so the module is, is just shifting the, the weight, not the degree, okay. just the weight. So that's what this three represents there. should shift it in negative. <coughs> as All right. And then if you want something where you, you, you don't have the vacuum on the other side, you can consider the tautological bundle over uh, weight of projected plane. Um, here you'll see some of the DZs in there. You've got some nice quiver. Uh, you have the super. So there are some, the previous two don't have any real relations, but here you have some quadratic relations. Um, again, these just come from the polynomial algebra. So Z0 times Z1 is Z1 times Z0, and so on and so forth. Um, good. So this gives us a, a very clear representation of uh, this category, which is the semi-orthogonal piece. And it's just, again, the modules over this uh, uh, algebra. This over algebra with relations. OK. So now I'm just going to uh, briefly discuss the A model. Um, well, let me get, get yes. this right. Every example was non-compact. Every example was non-compact. Uh, I don't know what it means. Well, you have these local models. So you yes. Have 
fancy surgeries. Yes, yes. The, the sheaves are all supported on a compact subspace. Okay. Um, that, that will be true, but that certainly the GIT transition is, I mean, we're on affine space, so that's not compact. But, so if you, if you look at something like this, you have this exceptional divisor, and, and the sheaves will be supported on that exceptional divisor. So that's, that's going to be compact. So what are these um, component categories on the A model side? Well, so for this, I, I want to first look at the most elementary possible, uh, well, maybe not the most, but one of the most elementary uh, symplectic leftist vibrations I can. Uh, the only difference will be that it doesn't go to P1 or C, but it goes to C star. And it has just, but it just has a single unique critical point P with critical value Q. And this is a Morse, by the definition of symplectic leftist vibrations, a nice Morse uh, critical point. And I want to take something like this and I want to build a, a Fukaya Seidel category out of just something like this. And the way I do it uh, is I choose some other base point, let's say close to zero, uh, and I take a path from my critical point, or critical value, excuse me, to, to the space point. Uh, and then this gives a vanishing, what's known as a vanishing thimble. If I just take symplectic parallel transport and I, I imagine flowing into that, all things that flow into this critical point, what it will do is it'll trace out some ball, and that ball is uh, a Lagrangian ball, um, of course, with a boundary of Lagrangian sphere uh, right over this, this fiber here. Now, uh, if I'm in the exact setting, which I'm going to assume I am, uh, what, that, what I'll have is over the fiber, I'll have some exact uh, symplectic manifold, and I'll have a nice exact sphere, which is this vanishing cycle. And then I can try to build a Foucault category just by taking the category generated by this one uh, Lagrangian inside of my inside of my uh, fiber. But of course, that's not going to give me a very interesting category. Um, and so if I want more objects, and all I have is this, this atomic luscious vibration, I just apply monodromy, and I'll get a new path with a new vanishing cycle, and I'll do it again, and I can get many, many uh, objects in my fiber, as many as I like, really. And so, in this situation where I just have this atomic leftist vibration, I can define a category that I'll call the n-unfolded category, which is some directed a infinity subcategory of this Fukaya category, just made up of these Lagrangians. So again, this is the Fukaya category, the fiber of my chosen base point. And then the Fukaya Seidel <laughs> category is just the category of twisted complexes uh, of, this, of this directed a infinity subcategory. So what do I mean by directed? What I mean is I just enforce a rule, and the rule says that if, if, I'm, if I'm going forward, I'll keep all of my morphisms. If I go backwards, I have no morphisms, and otherwise, I just keep the identity from an object to itself. And this gives me a nice A infinity uh, algebra, uh, which is the endomorphism algebra of the sum of these objects. And I can talk about twisted complexes over that A infinity algebra. Yeah. So how do you how do you make this money? Which choices did you make? Which choices did you make to get those vanishing cycles? On the previous slide, you very quickly said that you should take different parts, get different monotropies, but now we ended up with a finite set of finishing one vanishing cycles. I just I go from so each time I do a, apply a monodromy, uh, I introduce so in other words I go around one zero once yeah. I oh, add another one. So I'll go from, the, the only thing I choose here is n. That what's n? n is a it's a choice. Ran random issue. It's, it's, it's a positive, positive integer. Positive, yeah. positive integer. Yeah. Yeah. At, at this stage, that's all it is. So I call this the so, n. So for, 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 any, for any n, you can do this construct. Right? Any, yeah, any So another way of doing this, if you don't like this prescription at all, which I can understand, is you take this, uh, you take, say, the universal cover, take the log of this, this map, pull back, now you get some very you know, big uh, symplectic manifold uh, up here, and you can just isolate uh, a, a little strip. And now you have over that strip a nice symplectic manifold with a finite number of more singularities, and you can take your usual Fukai-Seidel 
over that, and, and then a theorem of of uh, Seidel says that so, says that these two categories will be equivalent. You have to interpret a theorem of Seidel, but uh, these two will be equivalent. All right. So uh, I have one minute. Good. So let me just describe <laughs> this particular case. So what is this? So I I describe this element A. And I, I said that this gave us a, an elementary birational cobordism. What is the mirror of that? Uh, well, for that, you take a d-dimensional pair of pants, which is just a hypersurface setting all the, uh, the sum of all of the coordinates equal to zero in PD plus one, and taking off the coordinate hyperplanes. Then you can define with this element A, where again, we added that last, last element A, D plus one, you can define a pencil on your projective space and it's given by just taking uh, the monomial corresponding to the positive uh, coordinates and the monomial corresponding to the negative coordinates, of course, adding a negative so we have a positive. And then because of this uh, homogeneity or balancing condition, we have an actual pencil uh, given by psi a. And I can restrict that pencil to my d-dimensional pair of pants, and this is the smear uh, uh, superpotential to uh, this elementary birational cobordism, conjecturally. Well, so we showed in, uh, uh, <coughs> I would say GKZ probably showed this without saying it this way, and then we just uh, made the observation that this is then an atomic Lefschetz vibration, so it has one more critical point um, and one more critical value. And this potential really appears as an equivariant quotient of uh, of the homological mirror potential to BGIT as predicted by, say, Gibbenthal and, and uh, uh, Hori Lafa. And so then this is the theorem that I wanted to get to, which just says that uh, if I take any n uh, <coughs> less than the sum of the positive uh, coordinates and greater than or equal to 1, then there's this strict fully faithful functor relating this n unfolded category to the category of modules, <laughs> equivariant modules, uh, over this algebra RA that we saw before. And it takes the kth uh, Lagrangian, or at least a particular version of the kth Lagrangian, to this uh, weighted module shifted right there. So as a corollary, this is the last slide, so as a corollary, um, we, get a, we get this equivalence in this case between these uh, semi-orthogonal component categories. So we have homological mirror symmetry, at least in pieces for these guys. Um, and then as a special corollary of this corollary, corollary squared, we have the, the folklore result that if we just look at the case where all of the AIs are positive, um, except of course this D plus one that we added, then we get homological mirror symmetry for just weighted projective space, which was proved in the plane case by Baruch, Kutsarikov, and Orloff, and in the unweighted case by Ueda and Fukaki. And others, but is I think uh, this is the first time this level of generality is. Uh, I, I, I'm not good at the HB exponent. Horikov. Horikov. Okay. So the usual. So this is you know kind of notation <coughs> to this particular talk, but these in fact this is exactly the Horikov potential. This is shown. So there are some preprints online uh, under that prove this, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, thank you for your attention. Any questions? Yes. Do you have any ideas what will happen in the non-final case? In the non-final case? I mean, so the hope is that if you have, let's say you have some non, well, I don't know about, so non-final, we've actually dealt with some non-final cases, even in the toric setting, and we're able to still run this kind of a program. Uh, and so the, I, I don't think, although you have to be a little more delicate, so the idea is you have some bigger Fano stack that you can get to the non-fano case through partially going through a minimal model program. You get something non-fano, and then you, you do run this program from that point on. Yes, so um, and and that, work, that works <laughs> just fine. Um, so you can actually take the minimal model program so that it becomes more fun, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you run it back in that way? I mean, do you know what I'm saying? I, I don't know if I, I completely so you, you can you can move you can run the minimal whole program against the uh, uh, 
positive now, so that it becomes more positive. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. No, that's. Yeah. I think that's what I'm. Yeah. What you're saying. What I'm saying. Yeah. So yeah, I think in the non-final case, and we can. The hope would be that in in other cases, if you had a potential, uh, and you had a minimal model program, even if it was you know non-toric or. General situation that, that these components will appear and then you can reduce to some minimal model uh, question for homological results. Uh, and then you would have the same thing as if you expect that it would have been a whole bunch of thing that it would be a broad change of all the things. Yeah, this is, yeah, this horrible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Are there any general conditions? So now whether a, whether a collection of Lagrangians is a complete exceptional collection? So, I mean, so if I look at a Foucault Seidel category with uh, Lashitz vibration, uh, then this is a theorem that this will give us a complete exceptional collection. Um, it's almost a part of the de one definition of such a category is that the, van the vanishing cycles coming from thimbles of a distinguished collection of paths generates the Foucault Seidel category in that case. Oftentimes, mirrors don't appear, don't fit this nice norm, and so then you have to really ask yourself what kind of category this is, and many people are, are asking and answering that question in different ways. Um. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Um, and yeah. now there is the launch of the Agave